بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين على أمور الدنيا ودين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد الخاتم النبيين وآله وصحبه أجمعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم طيب so just review from last week right we did الله ولي الذين آمنوا يخرجهم من الظلمات إلى النور والذين آمنوا والذين كفروا والذين كفروا أولياءهم الطاغوت يخرجونهم من النور إلى الظلمات أولئك أصحاب النار هم فيها خالدون so just to review, the first one, the first one, Allah will the Amanu, these are considered to be the ones who believed in Muhammad Sallallahu but they didn't believe in Isa. So they were in darkness, but Allah brought them to light. The second group is the, uh, the ones who believed in Isa, والسلام, but did not believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they were in the light because they accepted Islam, which was the time of Isa, which was Islam, but they disbelieved in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which made them disbelievers, kufar, during the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The next ayat, Alam tara ila ladhi haji Ibrahima fi rabbihi an atahu Allah al-mulk. Have you considered, right? Have you thought about the one who argued and debated with Ibrahim in regards to his Lord, right? What does it mean, the Lord? This is a quick, because we need to know when we talk about Allah. When we say Allah is Rabbuna, right? Rabbu samawati wal ard, right? What is the Rabb? Anybody know what's the Rabb? The one that gives life and death. That's one of the qualities of the Rabb. What else? Provides. Provides. He's the one that feeds us to make sure that we have everything we need to exist. Sustains us and maintains the whole everything, right? Don't we see that from what's being talked about here? That brings the, 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 the sun from the east every day. But also one of the things we learn about the Rabb from the definition of Rabb is the Rabb is a Sayyid. The one who's obeyed. The leader. There's some obedience to him, right? He's the leader. Or the one who, when we say rub, also just in the language, why, that's why the person is called, uh, or the lady is called rubber to bates, right? Or rubber to dab. They call the woman sometimes rubber to dab. What does that mean? She's the maintainer and caretaker of the home. She's the one that keeps the home in order, right? For sure, the men don't keep it in order, right? They mess it up and throw stuff everywhere, right? But the lady, she comes back after you put your books everywhere, the books there, there. She comes and puts the book there. Keeps it in order, right? Make sure that food is given to you at the right time. She's rubber to die. When it keeps it in order, maintains the home, correct? So Allah maintains and controls the whole universe. Everything in creation. Allah makes sure that it's taken care of. SubhanAllah. So this man, Alam Tarayladi Haj Ibrahim fi Rabbihi and Atahullah Muk. Why did he debate? Because Allah gave him some mulk, some possession, some dominion. So he thought he was somebody, right? And who was this person? Nimrod, right? Nimrud, right? And we said that the four people who ever, who were the four kings who controlled the whole earth? Don't look at your notes. Use your memory. Make your memory strong. Dhul Karnayn was a believer, right? Two were Muslims and two were Kafirs. The first one was Dhul Karnayn, right? Not the first, but two of them. Dhul Karnayn and who else? Suleiman who? Ibn Dawood, right? So Ibn Dawood, the son of Dawood, alayhi salatu wasalam. The prophet, not just the son of the prophet, right? Who were the two non-Muslim ones? Nimrod and who else? Bukhta Nasr. Nebuchadnezzar, right? In English it says Nebuchadnezzar. You heard this name before anyone? You study in English, right? History? Nebuchadnezzar. And in Arabic they say Bukhta Nasr, right? It's a very difficult name. So, alhamdulillah, nobody wants to be called that, right? So anyway, this one was Nimrod. When did this, when did this, when was it said that, when was it said that this debate or this argument happened between Ibrahim and Nimrud? After he broke the idols and they imprisoned Ibrahim, he brought him out to give him a chance, right? Ibrahim, just say you believe in me, Ibrahim. He said, nah, kalla, I'm not doing that. Right? Tayyip. Then he told him what? What was the proof that Ibrahim used first? My Lord is the one that gives life and gives death. Look at how this person gave us a weak, weak, weak example of him. No, I, but I don't know what he means. And he brought one person saying, you go free and he killed the other one. It's so weak. But I'll show you something about Kufar, about disbelief and ignorance, period. That when you fall into sin and disobedience, it messes with your head. You can't think straight. So he brought this example of him giving, he didn't give life to another person was already alive. But he thought it meant sense. And that's one of the biggest problems with arguing. Especially if you're arguing with your desires. There's no proof there. You're always going to say some dumb stuff. Because you're not arguing for the sake of the truth. 
Then he said what? What did Ibrahim use as a proof after, after that? That my Lord is the one who brings the sun from the east every day without missing a beat. Without missing, does anyone worry about the sun rising? It's going to come because we that the same way we don't worry about the sun rising. Right? Give me an example. The same way we trust that every day Allah is going to bring the sun up. The same way we should trust Allah for everything else. Right? The same way we trust that Allah is going to bring the sun. The same way we should trust Allah. That we don't have to do haram. We don't have to eat haram. We don't have to make haram money. Allah is going to take care of us, right? Bring the sun up every day. So why do we doubt? We don't doubt that the sun is going to rise, but we doubt that Allah is going to take care of us and protect us and provide for us. The same Allah, right? The same Rabb of everything. Ta'ya? Then we say what? What's after this? Fabuhi kafar, right? So he was defeated. He couldn't say nothing. Fabuhi means he couldn't speak. He didn't know what to say after that. He was confused. He knew that he was done. Abu Dhabi did kafir. Wallahu la yahdil qawma zalimin. Right? Allah will not guide the oppressive people. We warned about oppression, right? Oppression is Allah, Allah the Prophet said, al-dhulm dhulumat yawm al-qiyamah. Oppression will become like darkness on yawm al-qiyamah. When you want light that day for sure, you don't want that darkness to come to you on yawm al-qiyamah. Tayyip, so we'll go to the next ayah. Zubair, read the next ayah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. في ذا قراءة القرآن فاستعد بالله. Right? Whenever you want to read the Quran, say the ta'weez. What is the ta'weez? What is that أعوذ بالله from the Quran? What is that for us? Wudu for your mouth. Right? Who knows the stuff you were saying? Right? It's wudu for your mouth to clean your mouth out before you start saying the words of Allah. Right? That shows you how honored the words of Allah are. You can't just start talking. Oh no! This is the words of Allah. The angels shake when they hear the words of Allah. Us, we're just like, yeah, Allah said, you know, call Allah, right? The angels shake when they hear it. What did Jibreel do to the Prophet Sallallahu when he brought it? When he brought the Quran, he told him the Iqra. What did he do? Did he tell him? Hey, it's a bit Iqra, man, you know. This is what he did? What did he do? He did he just shake him? That's all? He grabbed him, bear hugged him, and pressed it and shook him, right? Big difference. Imagine being squeezed by an angel who, in reality, when the Prophet saw him, said his size covered the horizon. That wasn't a little deal. He said he, he couldn't breathe. So take it serious when you read the Quran. Again, Bismillah. <laughs>
Okay, time. Exactly, قال كم لبثت قال لبثت يوما أو بعض يوم قال بل لبثت مئة عام فانظر إلى طعامك وشرابك لم يتسنه وانظر إلى حمارك ولنجعلك آية للناس وانظر إلى العظام كيف ننشزها ثم نكسوها لحمة فلما تبين له قال أعلم أن الله على كل شيء قدير وإذ قال إبراهيم رب أرني كيف تحيي الموتى قال أولم تؤمن قال بلى ولكن ليطمئن قلبي قال فخذ أربعة من الطير فصرهن إليك ثم اجعل على كل جبل منهن جزءا ثم ادعهن يأتينك سعيا واعلم أن الله عزيز حكيم طيب so we have two nice stories here beautiful stories mashallah and the Quran has the most beautiful stories right if you just enjoy them properly so who knows who the first story is about anybody did any homework anybody pre-study طيب no problem the first story is about Let's go back first. The ayah that says, or, right? Or giving a statement. Now it's going to talk about another story. Now it's going to tell the story of the one who passed by a village, right? And this village was destroyed. And it wasn't destroyed any type of way, Asma, right? It was destroyed in a way where the roof fell first, right? And then after the roof fell in, then the walls fell on top of the roof. This is a different type of section, right? That it was destroyed where the roof was under its walls. You understand that? So let's say we have this here. This is the roof. The roof fell first, and then the walls fell over it. Instead of the walls falling first, and the roof falling on top of the walls, the roof is the first thing that collapsed, and the walls fell on top of it, right? It's a different type of destruction, right? So that's what it means by uh, So he said, wow, how will Allah bring this back to existence after it's been destroyed? Motiha here was referring to one of the two things the ulama said. This is the balagha of the Quran. We don't want to go too far into it, but of how does walls die? Right? Walls don't die, but it's the balag of the Quran that Allah is giving, it's what is called, uh, uh, it's the, uh, that Allah is giving or showing the example of a city being destroyed by giving it human qualities. Death. That's not a quality of a city. Unless there's another opinion of the scholars that is talking about the people of the city. But the number one opinion in regards to it is that it's talking about, that it's talking about the actual city being destroyed. And this was given a way of giving it human characteristics to make it more realistic. Right? It makes it more realistic. How is Allah going to bring this back and bring this back into order after it's been destroyed? Right? So Allah calls him to die, right? So the eye, let's go back then, right? The story matters. I just thought this. I, first, I thought I can tell the story after, but the story matters at first. So first thing we want to ask you, why do we think this ayah, talking about the resurrection, right? The two ayahs that we're going to read today, both of them are about Allah giving life to death. Why do we think these two ayahs came right after the ayahs that were before? Somebody has to tell me. Think hard, strong. When we talk about the siyah, or how the context, when ayahs in the Quran come, is not by accident. That this two eye, these two ayats came right after the ayat that came before. Why? It both okay, but why? What's in Mashallah, Abdul Rahman, we really think that you're going to become some big shaykh one day. Right? May Allah protect you. That? That's what the whole argument between Imra, uh, Ibrahim and Imrud was about. About Allah giving life. So Allah immediately after that, he brings what? Two beautiful examples of how Allah made, uh, gave, took life and gave life. 
right? Nimrod gave two whack examples. Allah gave the most beautiful examples, right? So, that's why. Jazakumullah khairan, may Allah bless you. Now, this story is about a man named Uzair. Anybody ever heard of this man named Uzair before? Never? What do the Yahud say? The Jews said that Isa was the son of Allah, right? And the Jews said what? Uzair ibn Allah, right? They said that Uzair was the son of Allah. Anybody ever wonder why? Just went past the eye and it was like, oh, that's what the Jews said. Now, inshallah, today you'll know why the Jews claimed that Uzair was the son of Allah. So again, the, Jew, the Christians, right, said that Jesus, alayhi salatu wasalam, was the son of Allah. The Jews had a claim that Uzair was the son of Allah. So Uzair was a man from amongst Bani Israel, right? And they say he came during the time between David, Dawood, and Suleiman, and between Zachariah and Yahya. He came between this time somewhere, right? I don't know when, but around this time is the time that he came, right? Before Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam. So Uzair one day was traveling somewhere. He had some village, he had like a garden or something. And he went to his garden, did his thing at his garden, he was coming back. He had with him some figs, some teen, and I'll see some drink with him, right? And he, he went past this village, I mean this village that was destroyed this day, and he decided, oh, you know what, I'm gonna take a little nap here and eat. So he ate, and you know what happens when you eat, you get tired, right? So he ate his figs, his teen, and he drank his juice and had some bread, and he put the bread with the oil, and you know, so the bread could become soft, and he ate the bread with the drink, right? And the figs. So now he's full, he's tired, I'm gonna take me a nap, right? And this was like during the beginning of the day, midday area. So he decided to take a nap, but before he took a nap, he was in that state of, oh, thinking about stuff, right? When you fall and you go to sleep, and he says, Man, he looked around. He said, how is Allah? Now, Uzair was a righteous man. He wasn't a Catholic. So his statement wasn't out of disbelief of Allah. It was a statement out of seeking to understand how great Allah was. It's the Ab, it's the Azam Allah, right? He wanted to see how great is Allah. He knew Allah was great, but he wanted to see it. Do you understand the difference? It wasn't a statement out of disbelief like, oh, Allah, you can't do it. It was a statement of Allah, I want to see, I wonder how, right? How is Allah going to do it? So that was his statement. How great really is Allah? Not that he denied the greatness of Allah, but he wanted to see it. Does that make sense or not? So he started looking around and said, how is Allah going to bring this back into existence? This place, destroyed like this. So Allah caused him to die. Right? How old? He was about 40 years old at this time. He was about 40 years old. So when Allah caused him to die, Allah caused him to die for how long? How long did Allah cause him to die for? A hundred years. Allah caused him to die for a hundred years. Then he brought him back to life. Then he saw the angel. He, brought, he sent the angel to bring him back to life. Go bring Uzair back to life, right? So while Uzair is being brought back to life, what's the first thing that Allah created inside of him to bring him back to life? Because he was bones. Nothing was there. You know, time went on. His body wasn't preserved, right? So what was it? The first thing Allah brought back to life. His what? What did you say? Don't say it. Guess. Give me the opportunity to guess. Huh? What did you say? His food? No. His, from his body, what was the first thing Allah brought back to life? His what? His head? A part of his head. What part of his head was it? His eyes. The first thing Allah gave him back was his eyes. So he could see what's happening to him. He gave him back his eyes, and then he gave him his heart. So that his eyes can see and his heart can understand. Right? His eyes are seeing it, and his heart is comprehending and understanding what's happening. So while his body is being given life back to him, he's seeing it all happening. That his arms are coming back, his legs, then the flesh is coming on top of it. He's watching this happen. Right? So then, after this, the angel comes to him. The angel says to him, how long have you stayed here for? How long were you out? So when Allah gave him back to life, it was closer to the end of the day. Right? So he thought that he just slept to the end of the day. So he said, uh, uh, this is, you know, part of the day. I took a nap. I was just out for like a couple hours, right? So the angel responds back to him, Qala bella bitta mi'ata'am. No, rather, you were asleep, you were dead for a whole year. I mean, excuse me, a hundred years. 
100 years you were gone for. So he's like, oh, it's unbelievable because now he's like, you know, how is that? But now look at the miracle of what Allah did. His food and drink never changed this whole 100 years. You see how big of a miracle this is in reality? No, no, the donkey did, but not the food and the drink. Now, why is that such a huge miracle? Food expires. The Abdulwali family again, may Allah bless you all. Right? Food and drink expires immediately almost, right? What happens when you leave grapes out for too long? They get soft and they get, you know, like, oh, I don't want those grapes. Get new ones, right? Figs are the same thing, right? And when you drink, it's going to go bad. And then they said he has some milk. And milk it starts to turn into cheese if you leave it out, right? But the food and drink, right? That's what you have to send them. It didn't change at all. The situation of your food and drink is exactly how you left it. So he's looking at it like, yeah, but my food and drink is right there. Same way I left it. That makes sense? Same way I left it, it's right there. Then Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, says, Now look into your, now look at your, 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 your donkey. And we're going to make you a sign for the people. You're going to be a sign, an ayah for the people. He says, Look at how we clothe it, right? How we, um, excuse me, we bring it back into existence, right? And we cause its bones and flesh to come back on it again. So he's watching this happen. Then all of a sudden, then the donkey's standing up again. He just watched the donkey was white. The bones of the donkey was sitting there white with bones. No flesh on it at all. You can think of a hundred years sitting in the sun. Right? Or sitting outside. It's going to be nothing. Almost, you know, just bones. No meat on it or anything. Allah right in front of him brought the flesh and the meat back onto the donkey. Right? And then the donkey's sitting up ready to be ridden. Like nothing ever happened. Then... Allah says, فَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ قَالَ أَعْلَمُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ So when it became clear to him, he said, I know for sure that Allah is over everything capable. أَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ That Allah is over everything. أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Allah is capable to do any and everything. So for us, that's a reminder. But as well as the people during his time, what happened was the rest of the story of Hosea, right? So Hosea now... Once he gets back to life and um, his donkey, he jumps on his donkey, right? Uzair was famous person during this time, right? So he rides his donkey back to his village. So when he gets there, he doesn't recognize anyone, right? He's like, who are all these people? They don't recognize him and he doesn't recognize anyone. But when he gets back to his house, there was a maid, a servant that used to work in his house. She was 120 years old when he came back. She was 120 years old. When he died, she was only 20. Right? When she died the first time, she was only 20. When he came back, she was 120. She was blind at this time. She couldn't see. So he came in the house. He said, hey, is this the house of Hosea? And she said, yes, this is Hosea's house. And she started crying. Oh. So why are you crying? She said, because I haven't heard anyone mention his name in so long. Right? Nobody has talked about him in the longest time. I don't even remember anybody who remembers him right now. She's 120 years old. 100 years ago he passed away. That's what happens when you die. If you don't know about it, right? People are talking about you in the first two, three years. And after a while, people say, who was it? Unless you do what? Unless you do what? What's the thing that people will always remember you for in Shalom? Not even just doing something good, no. Alien. Knowledge. Right? Think about it. Do you know any doctors from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Does anybody remember any doctors from that time? But you remember the names of the Sahaba, right? Does anybody know any of the doctors or rich people from the time of uh, uh, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah? You know? Right? Anybody? Oh, I remember that one rich guy there. No. Money and nothing else matters besides knowledge. Look, subhanAllah, a thousand years later, we still say these names. Bukhari. And we make dua for them. Rahimahullah, right? If you really want to leave an impact, leave your impact with aim, with knowledge, right? Do something that the deen will benefit from you by. The Muslims will be able to learn and live by you through, right? So anyway, 
They said, man, who, who, who's Ozan? Well, so they, they, they move in and she says, man, I haven't heard about Ozan so long. Now, Ozan was somebody whose dua used to be accepted. When he made dua, when he would make dua, his dua would be accepted. So she says, oh, so he says, I'm Ozan. She says, you can't be Ozan. Ozan died 100 years ago. He said, I'm Ozan. She said, okay, if you're Ozan, make dua for me that I will not, that I'll be able to see, and then I'll see if you really are Ozan. So he made dua for her, and her eyesight came back. Right? And she was able to see. And she said, she looked, oh, you are Uzair. Right? So then now, he had a son that was still alive. He was like 110, 120 years old too, right? So they took him to the son, his son, Uzair's son. And they said, oh, Uzair. You know, uh, so that, that's the son of Uzair. He was 40, 140, actually. The son was 140 or so like this, right? So they took him to the son, and the son was 140 years old. And they said, man, this is Uzair, your father. He said, I can't be my father. Uzair died 100 years ago. So they, they, you know, they remember that it was Uzair. They said, okay, if you're Uzair, that's what they tell them. Listen to the Jews. They brought him a, 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 a test. They said, okay, if you're Uzair, read to us the whole Torah. Because the Torah wasn't like the Quran. Everyone didn't memorize the Torah the way that people memorize the Quran, right? So they said, if you're Uzair, Uzair was special. He memorized and knew the whole Torah by heart. He said, if you're Uzair, tell us the Torah. Because the Torah was also sort of forgotten at that time. Because Uzair was one of the last people to remember it completely. All right? So Uzair sat down and began to write. And when he began to write, they said, fireballs came from the sky and went to his chest. Boom! And he was able to remember the whole Torah word for word and didn't miss anything. So when he did this, the Jews started to claim, you must be the son of Allah. How are you able to you know, remember it like that? Nobody else can do it. And that's why the claim came from that he was the son of Allah. And as well, that Uzair was young. He came back looking like he was, he was 40. Right? His son was 140. Looks like he's 140. The late, everyone else is so much older. So they think there had to be something special about him. And he remember the whole Torah word for word? You're the son of Allah. That's where the claim came. They started to say like this. You understand this part? Mm -hmm. Any questions about this? We understand Jose? Who was Jose? What time did Jose come? Um, huh? Between Suleiman and Dawood in the time of Zechariah, right? Good. So Jose was from the people of who? Benis. Benis right Tell me a benefit. Somebody, go ahead. Oh, no. So when the angel, like the angel came to him, was like, he come like a unicorn? Or? Mm, I don't know. I didn't read it anywhere about it, how he came. He came. Somebody tell me a benefit from this story. Nobody has any benefit? Did we talk all that time for nothing? Muhammad, give us a benefit, please. You. Very, benef very beneficial. He saw the greatness of Allah in action. He actually saw Allah bring him back to life. Himself back to life. Someone else give me a benefit. Ms. Alexander, give us a benefit. First day in class. Hopefully not the last day. Um, to to revive the Prophet. He was able to revive the Torah for the Jews. So that's a benefit. Now, um, Fatima, give me a benefit. Um, for you. For me? Yeah. yeah. For you. Any benefit should always benefit yourself first. It's a rule, right? So give me a benefit that you benefited from the story. Allah, what? That brings us to our what is a miracle? Or what we would consider from the prophets is called a mu'ajizah. From the prophets is called a mu'ajizah. From non-prophets it's called karam. It's something that happens that's outside of the norm of the laws of um, the norm of the laws of, what's this thing called? Not nature, but the laws that Allah created. We don't want to say nature. Nature has nothing to do with anything. But the laws of how Allah, the laws that Allah set for creation. Right? 
It happens outside the normal laws that Allah set for creation. A person who's blind normally is not supposed to be able to see again, right? That's, a, that's a, outside the normal laws of creation. I'll tell you. Uh, give me a benefit. His grave? Greatness. Well, somebody said that already. Another benefit. Anyone else have any other benefit? In the back. The young scholars in the back. Um, Asma. Bismillah. Huh? What did she say? After having accepted. Yeah, that's true. We'll accept that. Go ahead, Abdul, Abdul Nasser. Are you, you chilling, Governor? It's okay. Just answer the question. Okay. Um, Abdul Nasser. The next ayah is in regards to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, right? Now this ayah here, Allah Ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى The Ibrahim, he said, oh my Lord, right? وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ Oh my Lord, Rabbi. I have a question for you as well. This Lord, this name Rabbi, right? Rabbi. If you notice in the Quran, Almost all the du'a in the Qur'an start with Rabbi, except for like two. It's amazing, right? Every du'a in the Qur'an starts with Rabbi, except for around two, I believe it is. Right? What's so amazing about that? The prophets, when you see in the Qur'an, the prophets always call out, Rabbi, Rabbana, Rabb, right? Why is that? It's very important that you understand the names of Allah properly. Why do we think that they call out by this name? Oh, wait, what I told you the other day? So I want you to answer it. Um, it, like, it gives... Hmm? What does the name Rub mean? We're we'll talking about it again. The one that takes care of you, right? Nurtures you. So they're calling out to Allah by that connection. Allah, you take care of me. Nobody else takes care of me. You're the one that nurtures me. Nurtures meaning what? Murabi meaning what? Make sure that everything goes okay for you. Right? Rabbi, the one that I'm connected to in that man, that's a special type of connection. Right? Enemy kafa to him all the time. Show me how you show me how you give life to the death. Dead. Big deal, right? Yes, no, big deal? Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam. And we know that Ibrahim was from the what? The most strongest of believers, right? Why did Ibrahim say this? Was it that Ibrahim didn't believe? No, he just wanted to see. Out of curiosity, not out of doubt. Out of, well, how do you do it, Allah? Right? I know you do it, but increase me in my iman and show me how you do it. Right? That's like saying, like, okay, everyone here knows I'm the best basketball player ever, right? So, you know that I'm the best basketball player, but you say, well, I just want to see it. But you don't doubt that I'm the best basketball player ever, right? Yeah. You just want to see it. So that's not that you don't disbelieve in it, right? It's the same thing. But with Allah is the better example. That uh, Ibrahim knew that Allah could do whatever he had to do, but he just wanted to see it. Do you think if he had not seen, he would still believe? Without a shadow of a doubt. Without a shadow of a doubt. Because it wasn't a statement of disbelief. It was a statement of curiosity. A statement of how do you do it? Similar to the same thing with Uzair. It wasn't that Uzair was a disbeliever. He just wanted to see, you know, but how, how is Allah? Because it's enna and kaif are similar words. Enna and kaif both mean how. Not do you, O Allah. Right? He's not asking, Allah, do you give life to the death? Like doubtful. It was how do you do it? Show me. How do you do? I want to see. Do we, do we see the difference? So it wasn't a statement of him doubting or disbelieving in Allah, because doubt is disbelief. Remember that. You're not allowed to doubt Allah. If you doubt Allah, you don't believe in Allah. 
the belief in Allah has to be with what? Yaqeen. You have to be certain. Right? You can't doubt Allah. You can't doubt it even in the least. If you doubt it, then you are not a believer. We understand that? So what happened here? Why did Ibrahim say this? The beautiful story is subhanAllah. When you understand the stories behind the Quran, it increases your understanding and your love for the Quran. Right? So Ibrahim one day was by the um, beach, right? Basically the beach, the bank of the ocean, right? We call it the, beach, the shore of an ocean, right? And there was a body thrown there, somebody's body or whatever it was. There was a corpse. It was a human body or whatever it was. It was a corpse on the side of the ocean, like on the bank. It wasn't all the way in the ocean, but it was in the sand or whatever it was, right? So Ibrahim, he saw this body there, right? This, cor this corpse. Whether it was an animal or not, it doesn't mention, right? And then when he saw this body that was thrown there, then whenever the ocean would like go out, or whenever the ocean would come in, like the different animals that were in the ocean would try to take a bite from it, Arr, whatever, right? And they would bite a piece of it. You understand? They would take off a piece of it and go back into the ocean. And then when the water would go back, then the animals, the sea like the, um, the predatory animals, maybe hyenas or lion, whatever it was, they would come and eat some of it, right? And then when the water would go back, then when the animals, the lions and tigers or whatever it was that would come and eat from it, then the birds would come and eat from it, right? So the animals of the sea, the animals of the land, the animals of the, um, of the air all came and ate from this. So now this body is all in the belly of, this, of these different animals in different places, right? Ocean animals, land animals, and air animals. That's amazing. So Ibrahim is looking at this and saying, wow. Oh Allah, I don't doubt, oh Allah, that you'll be able to. Sorry, I'm too oh Allah, I don't doubt that you'll be able to. Um, what's the word? I don't doubt that you'll be able to. I don't doubt that you'll be able to give life to the animal, to the um, to this afterwards. But show me how you'll do it. You understand? Show me how you'll give life to it afterwards. And then after uh, he says this to Allah again, it wasn't out of doubt out of wanting to see. So he says, oh Allah, how do you do it? I just saw that the animals of the ocean came and ate from this, the animals of the sky came and ate from this, and the animals of the earth came and ate from it. How are you going to bring this, this person back to life? You understand where we're at now? So then Allah says to Ibrahim, call that what took me. Do you not believe? I what took me. Do you not believe? Call that Bella. He responded, No, of course I believe, right? Without any doubt, Bella, I believe. I just want to cause my heart to be at ease. I'm curious. And so when I remember they say that, you know, that burning curiosity that a person has in their chest sometimes, and they're trying to figure out how does this work or how does that happen? That was what was going on, Ibrahim. It was just a curiosity. How, Allah, how are you going to make this happen and accomplish this? So his chest is burning out of curiosity, right? Trying to figure it out. So he says, oh, I just want to calm or cool down my curiosity. Cool down my chest, right? So he says, so Allah says, What type of birds did Allah tell him to bring? فَقَالَ فَخُذْ أَرْبَعَةَ مِنَ مِنَ الطَّيْرِ right? So they said that he, was, he brought the tawus, the peacock, the gharaba, right? The crow, the dove, and also the chicken or rooster, right? He brought these three, these four types of birds, different types of birds, right? And he was told to slaughter them, you know, to cut them to pieces and put them on different mountaintops. Not just put them anywhere, but separate them far, right? And then after you do all that, call them back to you. And they come back to you. Allah brings them back together. The different birds. One bird didn't come, the, the peacock didn't come back half peacock and half chicken. The, the crow didn't come back half crow and half pigeon. They came back, each one came back with its specific pieces. So this shows the miracle of Allah to be greater than just what it was in the beginning. Each one came back perfect. Right? And Allah says after this, 
Anna Allah Azizun Hakim. So when you see this, you'll see that Allah is Aziz. He's mighty, powerful. He can do anything, right? And He's Hakim. He's wise. There is nothing that Allah does not place in His proper place. Everything is done by the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see from that there, right? Now, there's another benefit that comes here. Why did the story of Ibrahim come after the story of Uzair? But the first story was about Ibrahim as well, right? So the story between Imran, uh, uh, Ibrahim and Namruz, then it comes the story of Uzair, and then another story right after of Ibrahim. Why did Allah not just put the story of Ibrahim together, both of them, then the story of Uzair? What's the benefit there? Anybody? Tell you. The story with Uzair was more profound. Because Uzair didn't see, Ibrahim saw birds come back. Uzair saw himself come back to life. It's more profound. So the more profound story takes precedence. Even though Ibrahim's story is there as well, the story of Uzair was more profound and the, the, the effect of Allah giving life back to a whole human being and then the animal and the, the, the drinks and the food never changed. But the animal and the human being completely was back to bones. That's more of a profound story than the story when Ibrahim Ibrahim put the birds on a different mountaintop and they came back to them. Do you understand? Are there any questions in regards to that story? So I have questions for you. What animals did Ibrahim see? I mean, what, what birds were that Ibrahim slaughtered? What was the reason that Ibrahim wanted to see this? So, a lot of the stories like this, that the most of it comes from the, the, the stories from the Israeliyat, the they bring it in and narrate it. They narrate it. Some of the other, of course, there's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars about narrating the stories of the Israeliyat. But the more correct opinion from the, the statements of the ulama of Tafsir, the more correct opinion from us the statements of the ulama of Tafsir is that you narrate it, right? As the Prophet says, you narrate it, but you don't, have, you don't believe fully or you don't disbelieve, but you narrate it as extra facts. As extra facts or extra information about the story. That's it. So what was the reason that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, um, what was the reason that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, asked about this? Was it that Ibrahim disbelieved? But it was only that Ibrahim he wanted to see it with his own eyes how Allah does it. Not that he didn't believe Allah does it. He just wanted to see how he does it. It's a big difference, right? They're disbelieving in it and saying, well, Allah, do you do this? Are you capable of doing this? That wasn't the situation at all with Ibrahim We have to be clear about that because some people, they try to utilize it as a false way to say that having doubt is acceptable. Having doubt in your iman is not acceptable and it's kufr. You are not allowed to doubt anything about what Allah and His Messenger have informed us about. We clear? Is that clear? Tayyip. So now, inshallah, we said that if we have time, what time is it? 3.30? Oh. Hmm. Quickly, inshallah, we'll, we'll mention some things from the story of the time from Ashura. Inshallah. So, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, when he was calling Fir'aun and his people, right? He called Fir'aun and his people and they said that he stayed amongst Fir'aun giving da'wah for around 30 years. Around 30 years he's giving da'wah and calling them to, uh, to Tawheed, to call them to the Haq, right? So they don't accept. So then one day at the end, Allah, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he made dua that Allah, you know, after this, Allah sealed their hearts, right? Don't guide them to finish them off. So when Allah responds back to this dua, and he finally calls out to Musa, okay, take your people at night time, but be careful, you're going to be followed. Right? So Musa, the plan was that it was inspired to Musa to tell his people the plan to tell Fir'aun, to ask permission from Fir'aun, and say they have an Eid. 
They have a holiday that they have to celebrate. Can they go out and, you know, and take care of this holiday? Right? So Fir'aun reluctantly, not happily, reluctantly gave them permission. Right? And when he gave them permission to do such, he wasn't happy about it. But now what Ben Israel was told to do by Allah, so he was told to tell, to tell them, take the gold and silver from the people of Fir'aun. So they went to whoever they knew, whoever they might have had an association with them amongst the people of Fir'aun, and said, listen, we're having a party. Let us get some gold and silver, some jewelry. Right? Let's get your jewelry and stuff, right? So they got all the jewelry they could get and the gold and the silver that they could get from the people of Fir'aun. So then now they took this and put this with their stuff. So this is one of the ways that Allah took and expelled Fir'aun and took their riches from them, right? Took their riches and the things that they had. So when Fir'aun found out that they were trying to escape, he sent out to all of the different cities. It was mentioned, this is found in the, the stories of the Tafsir and the Kathir, and likewise other places, that it, the Fir'aun had over a thousand different cities under his guard. A thousand different cities and about 12,000 different villages. He had a big dominion, he had a big you know, kingdom. So he sent out to get as many people as he could get to try and chase after Musa and his people. Musa had amongst his people five, a half million that were supposed to be like fighters, right? That were going to fight if they had to fight. Fir'aun had over 100,000 horse riders. Over 100,000 horse riders. And his army was about one million and a half people. Right? It's a huge army. Have you ever seen a million and a half people? It's a lot of people. So... Now when they go out, Fir'aun finally catches up with them. They're looking for him, they're looking for him, they catch up with them at the ocean. Right? And it mentions in the story that the ocean, there was the ocean in front of them, and they had mountains on each side. Right? There's mountains on each side, and Fir'aun's army starts to come. So when they're able to finally see Fir'aun's army come, they become afraid. When they start to see each other, they say, oh man, there's Fir'aun's army, we're caught. So Musa, he was at the back of the, uh, back of the people of, uh, of um, Israel. And when he was at the back of the people of Israel, he then moves forward to the front. He moves forward to the front and they say, Musa, is this what you were ordered to do? Is this where we're supposed to bring us to? So Musa said, this is where I was ordered. Because Musa was told to go towards Sham, so it was the sea of Sham, but he didn't, wasn't told what was going to happen when he got there. So now we know there was a person from amongst the family of Fir'aun, with him, they say, was uh, his brother Harun, right? And as well, the believer from the people of Fir'aun. The man who believed from the people of Fir'aun was with Musa. So the person who believed from the people, the family of Fir'aun, he said, Musa, you sure this is what you were told to do? Musa said, said, yes. So he took his horse, and he tried to cross the ocean with his horse. Right, Bonita? Okay. He tried to cross the, cross the ocean with his horse. When he saw that he couldn't cross the ocean with his horse, he turned back. So now Musa and his people, the people are starting to get really afraid. And they see that they're coming close and they're determined that so we're going to have to fight. So when it came this far, Allah sent down to Musa and revealed to Musa, strike the ocean with your staff. Right? Strike the ocean with your staff. So when Musa struck the ocean with the staff, then the ocean opened up. And the scholars of the scholars said there was 12 different pathways that opened up for Musa and his people. So each one of the tribes of Ben Israel could take their path. And then after this, they said the wind came from the east and dried out the ground. And now the, the ground was dry because imagine the ocean floor, if it was just wet, it's still going to be, what do they call it, like soggy, I guess you could say, right? It's going to be hard to cross it with that wetness. It's been wet this time. You still might sink into it and get stuck. So Allah dried it out and it made it able for them to cross it. So then now Fir'aun sees this huge thing happen. They're watching on the horizon. So, whoa, imagine an ocean. I'm not talking about a river. What an ocean spreads open and it's spreading open with even 12 different pathways. Then Fir'aun is scared. He's nervous. Man, this is a sign. This is a, this is a sign here that, you know, I'm not, I'm not accept anything. And Musa has to be upon the truth. But he's too pride, too much pride and arrogance inside of him. Right? He can't accept it. Plus, his army is behind him, and he doesn't want to look to his army and like, you know what? They're right. Let me believe. So he still is hesitant from believing. He still is arrogant and his pride won't let him believe. So it says that Jibriya he comes on a horse, right? 
He comes as a horse rider and he brings Pharaoh's horse to the ocean, right? Musa, when he sees Pharaoh and his people coming, Musa wants to strike the staff. He wants to strike the staff again on the water and try to close the ocean back, right? So they can't follow him. But Allah tells Musa, leave it. Don't do it. Leave the ocean as it is. Because Allah had a bigger plan. He did not want Pharaoh not to be able to catch them. He wanted to destroy Pharaoh and destroy him in one of the most grand ways. So Allah told Musa, no, leave the ocean. Right? Leave it as it is. Open. Why? So Pharaoh and his people could try to come. So when, when Jibreel salam, brought the horse of Pharaoh, now Pharaoh is the leader. So when the people see Pharaoh's horse going towards it, they follow too. And Pharaoh couldn't stop his horse. So they bring and they go after and they follow um, uh, um, Musa into the ocean. And once all the people of Pharaoh were in the middle of the ocean, then Allah told Musa to strike the staff against the water again and close it. And the water surrounded and drowned the whole people. Then it continues to go that when they crossed the ocean, they saw this. This is a sign for the men of Israel. Look at Allah, how Allah destroyed them. And this was a need and also because of the fear that Ben Israel had for Fir'aun. They, some of them might have actually believed that Fir'aun might have possessed some of the parts, some of the some of the qualities he said in the They were afraid of him. After all that year, all that time that they were subjugated and enslaved by Fir'aun, some of that affected them psychologically. Similarly, we take them a benefit from that. Some of the ulama mentioned that. We sometimes are affected by our environment like that too, where we end up fearing the kufar are fearing where we're at more than we fear Allah. And we don't even realize it. That we're psych psychologically afraid to change because we're, in, we're, in, we're enslaved by our own minds. Sometimes your mind enslaves you more than actual chains. Right? So when Allah did this made a sign for so Allah says he's going to preserve the body of Fir'aun. Some of the scholars say that preservation of the body of Fir'aun was that Allah, they didn't believe that Fir'aun died. Some of the children of Musa, Ben Israel, they didn't believe he could die. So they were still like, no, Pharaoh is still alive. So Allah took his body and his armor, so they knew it was Pharaoh, and brought it to the top of the ocean. His lifeless body, and showed them that Pharaoh is dead. That's one of the, one of the interpretations of, the, uh, of this ayah. So then after this, the Ben Israel, they left and they went about their business at that time. But that's, in a nutshell, a quick summary of the story of Ashura. And this was said to happen on Ashura, which most commonly is known to be the 10th of Muharram. And Allah Ta'ala A'lam. Can you stop listening?